Okay, so uh, nice to meet you everybody. I'm Sebastian Sa. I'm the Associate Director of Agriculture Research at the Almond Board of California. In the next hour or so, we're going to be talking about hull rot, uh, an interesting disease that probably you, many of you are aware of it. And it's always nice to discuss about the cultural management and the different practices that we can do to identify uh, the different type of diseases that cause these symptoms called hull rot. For today, we have a set of three speakers that are joining us. Uh, they happen to be all from UCANR, uh, or, or long-term collaborators uh, in this area and in many other areas of research. So we're going to uh, have a hybrid session where first they're going to talk. Uh, two of the speakers are going to talk for half an hour in total, and then we're going to move into a Q&A question. Um, so the way it's going to work, uh, we have Brent Halls from this area, actually, a uh, former advisor from uh, Stan Stanislaus and, and San, jo San Joaquin, North San Joaquin Valley. We have Mohamed Jagamur, uh, also former advisor from the south. Uh, they both have a lot of background in pest management, uh, either be, uh, during their training as well as with their practical experience. Uh, we have Cameron Zuber. Uh, he's the uh, still new former advisor, I would say. Has been one year already, Cameron? Almost a year, almost a year since he joined uh, forces with the UC team. Uh, he's the former advisor at Merced County, and he has been working a lot also in disease management and, and pest management. So with that said, uh, let's uh, start with Mohammed, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, the biology, the symptoms of the disease, and then Brent's going to cover the cultural practices around it. And, and as I said, then we're going to move to a panel discussion with uh, moderated by Cameron. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohamed Yagmur, uh, and I'm the Orchard Systems Advisor for Kern County. It's my pleasure to be here, and uh, thanks to the Almond Board for inviting me today to be here with you. So today I'm going to talk mainly about the biology of the disease, uh, correct diagnosis for the different uh, pathogens uh, of her rot. So I like always to, to begin my, my talks with putting the famous disease triangle. And uh, usually the disease triangle has three major factors that you know contribute to, let's say, successful disease. So we need a aggressive pathogen, we need the susceptible host, and we need to have the environmental conditions that are conducive for disease development during the season. So when we are talking about <coughs> hull rot in particular, okay, those three factors will result in, in the disease we call hull rot. The hull rot usually uh, has uh, very distinctive uh, symptoms. Those symptoms usually, <coughs> we, we see them during hull split or at the end of hull split, just like 10 days before we harvest. And the distinctive uh, part of the symptoms of, of hull rot is shriveled leaves or dried leaves. So what happens <coughs> during hull uh, uh, rot, infections take place when hull split begins, all right? The pathogens gain entrance, all right, to the tissue. They start growing. Some of those pathogens, they produce toxins. Those toxins move back into the woody material, all right? And then they cause blighted tissue. They kill the tissue. And that's why we see the blighted or the dry uh, and the shriveled leaves, as well as what's really important about those diseases is that they kill the spurs. So this, those spurs are going to produce the bloom for next year. So <clears throat> when we have severe disease, we will expect that you know, this disease may affect next year's uh, yield. So the importance of this disease is not for the current year, because you know, at, at some point we're going to shake the trees. The shriveled leaves already going to go away. But what's really important is that this disease is going to affect or kill the spurs, that is going to bear the fruit for next year. That's why it's important. So I always tell my growers, 
the most important part before we even think about the management of any disease is to have the correct diagnosis. And to have the correct diagnosis, I always tell the growers, look for the signs. We have two, two most important uh, terms in plant pathology. We always say, as you, may, as you heard me saying before, symptoms, which is usually the reaction of the tree to the disease. In that case was the shriveled uh, leaves or dead spurs. Those are symptoms. But if we look for the signs of any pathogen, it will tell me exactly what I'm dealing with. And when we are talking about signs, it's usually any part of the pathogen that is distinctive for that pathogen. In those cases with hard rot, we are looking at the spores. For, and here, if we look at this black spores here, because they are jet black, it will tell me this is aspergillus. I will show other signs later on as I, I move through the slides. But signs will always tell me exactly what pathogen I'm dealing with. So signs of heart rot, you know, there's three major pathogens that are causing heart rot. The first one here is monalinia. And monalinia is the same, species is the same pathogen that is causing a brown rot on different storm fruits. Okay? So the, the symptom is always we see this brown lesion on the outside of the hull. But the signs of this disease, the picture here is not very clear, but there is tan brownish spores on the outside that comes out. So that will tell me that I'm dealing with monalinia. That's one. The second, this disease is more prevalent in the northern uh, part of the valley. So it's, it's more prevalent in the Sacramento Valley, but we don't see it much in the central valley down here in uh, northern San Joaquin or in Kern County. The sources of iniculum is important to know where it's coming from. Usually it's infected almond and stone fruit twigs or fruit mummies that are infected with the, with the pathogen that has spores on it still. The second one that has been prevalent in the past few years and they have done some extensive work on is Aspergillus niger. And when we are talking about Aspergillus niger, usually it grows between the hull and the shell. And the spores is very distinctive from the rhizopus, which is what we have for the most of the time during the, the past periods. And we all know about that is the major contributor to her rot. So, so it looks like powder. It's jet black. It is different. And the source of inoculum, it's usually found in the soil uh, on organic matter. Similarly, rhizopus, which we know very well that it's uh, causing the disease. Usually, if you look between the hull and the shell, they, they grew a mass of mycelium with a black spores. It's different. I like to call it a black to grayish. OK? It's not jet black as <clears throat> we see uh, with aspergillus. Rhizopus produce a toxin called fumaric acid. It will move inside the tissue, and it will kill the part of it will kill the spurs and part of the, of the branch. To know, uh, one of the good symptoms to know that we are dealing with, with rhizopus is if we scrap the, uh, the tissue here by the infected spur, we will see black streaks. So that will tell me that, you know, this is done by the toxin. The toxin moved in and caused those black streaks to show near the infected spur. Again, like aspergillus, those spores reside in the soil on, on organic matter. And I will show later on why those in, information are really important to know. This is some of the work done in Kern County showing the increased prevalence of, we collected 
different fruit from different infected spurs, showing hair rot, showing that aspergillus uh, is causing high amount there. Uh, Rhizopus is still, is still there, but significantly less. And, you know, it's also important to know that we can also find mixed infection, Rhizopus and aspergillus together on the same fruit. When I talked earlier that, you know, soil is a major source, here is the proof. What we did is simply just during different fruit development stages, I was collecting fruit. What I did is very simple. I collected those fruit, put them in container, just added sterile water on them, just washing the surface, collecting all the dust. You can see how much dust the can be collected on a fruit. Took that water plated and you can see rhizopus and this is mainly aspergillus. That's how much uh, aspergillus are naturally on a fruit. This is just to show you the, the population of each one, whether it's aspergillus niger or rhizopus. You see that the increase of the amount of the population is exactly coincides with hull split. Also, some of, of this data also indicate, you know, that the fungus already started during hull split to grow inside and producing those spores. So now we know that soil is an important source for hull rot pathogens such as Aspergillus niger and uh, and uh, Rhizopus stolenifer. Why that information is important? Okay, if you have hull split and you mow or create a lot of dust, all we are making is just putting those spores up in the air and they have the chance to go inside a splitted fruit and cause disease. So that will increase the susceptibility of uh, the fruit as well as increase the incidence. The other part of understanding the biology of this disease is understanding when the fruit is most susceptible for those pathogens. When we are talking about rhizopus stolenifer, work done by, work done by Dr. Jim Scavage had showed clearly that fruits in the deep V, when they are started to split, are the most susceptible for rhizopus. In Aspergillus niger, what I have shown is that, you know, the most susceptible is when the fruit is split at the C stage, started to split, okay? The ones that are at the deep V, similar to Rhizopostolifer, is still susceptible, but is not as susceptible as when they are already split, which makes sense, you know? The, the fungus goes in, needs a wound, or needs the fruit to be split for it to start causing the disease. Why this is important to know? This will be important uh, because if you plan ever to use fungicide, this is, those are the two stages that we would like to protect from the fungus and from the infection. We did also as I mentioned earlier, we know that the disease affects next, next year's yield, and we wanted to see if we can even find the threshold or know exactly how much the disease affects next year yield. So what I did here, this is some data from two orchards. One of them is in Kern County, the other one here in Madeira. So the one in Kern County, I have two plots. In each one, I took 28 uh, data sets where I come every year, see how many strikes, how many uh, uh, disease I have, how much disease I have in each plot, and I collect the yield for that tree next year. And then I look at the correlation. So what we are seeing here, when Trees in one plot, which is a sandy soil, had low numbers of, of strikes. We did not see much of 
effect on next year's yield. R square was approximately 2% of the decline in yield here was explained by Harrod. However, in another plot also, we can see more decrease in yield, okay? But still, you know, 13% was explained by how many strikes in that orchard. But this one, here we have only 12 points. We're gonna do this again next year. It's showing 50% of the yield decline was attributed in this orchard to hard rot. So the take home message from this data is one thing, okay? Orchards differ in their susceptibility. Whether you're gonna take um, a decision to, to manage this disease, add fungicide sprays or not, or just depend on cultural practices to manage this disease, It will depend on your own situation in your orchards. So in an orchard like this, where I have high incidence of hot rot affecting next year's yield, probably I will need to look more into managing this disease. In the previous plot, where I don't see much, probably I don't need to do much except cultural practices. So that's, that's what I have so far on this disease. So, thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, thank you uh, for the Almond Board for organizing uh, this uh, nice venue. And um, I'm going to continue the hall rot discussion. I'm Brent Holtz. I'm a farm advisor, as Sebastian said, in San Joaquin County. I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, the management of hull rot. As Muhammad said already, the almond is not susceptible to hull, hull rot until the, the hull is actually split. And then you can get the, the mold growing on uh, uh, the hull and it can release the toxin. And Muhammad went into detail on that quite a bit. I want to talk a little bit about the after effect. Is, you know, often growers don't notice the, the mold growing on the hulls at harvest time because they're too busy running around ha at harvest uh, trying to harvest their crop. It's, it's usually the next spring at, at, the, at almond bloom when, when there's no bloom on the, on the twigs that, that I get the calls and I got to come out and there's no more mold and there's no more almonds and, and I've got to figure out whether it's got hull rot or not. And, Usually at that stage, it's this staining in the vascular tissue that I have to look for to, to figure out if it was hull rot or not. But the other big reason is this is a grower that I battled with for years on his irrigation in Madeira. And this is the non prel row. I don't know if you guys can see that very well, but there's a, a real loss of lower canopy there. And the pollinator next to it, you know, often it was Carmel or Aldridge or Fritz you know, you would see that lower canopy. So it's a good indicator that you've had hull rot if you see your lower canopy diminishing in the non pareil variety. I'm going to talk about hull rot. Beth Tiviadale used to call it the gout of, uh, of good almond growers. Too much food and drink, and it's usually the, our, pr our productive, aggressive growing orchards that are, that are uh, growing very well that get hull rot. And it does respond um, to cultural control, so I'm going to talk about that mostly. And I'm not going to emphasize fungicide applications to control hull rot. Because I think we need to basically save our fungicides for some of the other diseases that we have in almond and, and not try to build up resistance. So I'm going to start off by, by, not, by saying I don't want you to use fungicides primarily for hull rot control. I want to have you focus on nitrogen and irrigation management. And um, this is a, one of the first UC trials that I was involved with when I first started. Back in 1994, it was a nitrogen study in Salida, not too far from here, where they actually put 500 pounds of nitrogen on and 250, 125, and zero. 
but it was in Salida where there was uh, 50 parts per million of nitrate in the water. So the, the control was really 100, 225, 350, and 600 pounds of nitrogen. But we didn't get any yield response in, in that orchard with uh, those nitrogen treatments because I think because we had so much nitrogen in the water, but those are hull rot strikes. We saw a response to hull rot in that orchard, and this was one of our first clues that excessive nitrogen could stimulate hull rot. And then uh, in a later trial that uh, Sebastian here should be talking about and not me, in uh, Kern County um, <clears throat> with Patrick Brown and uh, they, they were doing another nitrogen trial in Kern County and they had different nitrogen treatments and they also saw a response to hull rot. So we've, we've had two different main trials um, <clears throat> that I believe the Almond Board has sponsored both of them and, and both of them have showed if you have more nitrogen, you have more hull rot. Now, um, nitrogen usage, uh, Sebastian, show, show that little pamphlet right there. Um, there's a nice nitrogen management guideline. And what I really want to say about nitrogen is that, you know, most of the growers I talk to now with the almond price going down and the nitrogen price going up, I hope there's not an excessive amount of nitrogen put out. I doubt there will be. But, you know, in this guideline, we talk about putting about 68 pounds of nitrogen back on for every thousand kernel pounds of of almond produced per acre. So, I mean, my, my main um, emphasis to you would be to replace the nitrogen you're taking out of that orchard and don't put excessive, you know, if you, if you have an average, you might want to fertilize to the average, but don't put, you know, if, if, you, if, you've, got if you've got 1,500 pounds of almonds per acre, don't put 300 pounds of nitrogen on. So try to keep that rule in mind in that that's outlined in that pamphlet and pick, and pick it up on your way out. And that's about all I'm going to say about nitrogen. Let's use it efficiently, effectively, put it on at the right time and place. And let's talk about irrigation. And this was a, a study that David Goldhammer did years ago. And, um, you know, it was, it was one of our first indicators that irrigation could have an influence on hull rot. And he tortured these poor trees, you know, some of them he took the water off 52 days before harvest down to taking the water off four days before harvest. And there were, there were some Carmel trees, I think, that died in this trial. But anyway, there was a tremendous hull rot in 1991 in this trial. And you can see that the hull rot was pretty low until we got between 11 and 18 days before harvest. And if we were still watering fully at 18 or less days before harvest, we had almost 600 strikes of hull rot per tree. But if we, you know, if we took the water off between 18 and 25, we were down under 100. So um, this, and, and Goldhammer wasn't a plant pathologist and he didn't care about hull rot, but he was just torturing the trees to see how they, they survived this irrigation treatment. But uh, he had Beth Tividale come in. And then David did some regulated deficit irrigation treatments. And <clears throat> I don't want you to pay a lot of attention to this graph, but I want you to look at, he had 100% control. This was the water applied, not, not including the, the rainwater that this orchard received. And the, the control got 39 inches of water. This is 100% ET throughout the season. And then the purple treatment got 34 inches of water. This is sustained irrigation at 85% through the treatment. This is 34 inches of regulated deficit irrigation, except in July and August, I mean, the first two weeks of July, he went to a 50% uh, irrigation regime. And those are the, the three treatments that let's, let's, let's focus on. And, and so here is um, the amount of water put on. Here's the control with 39 inches, and here's three treatments that got 34 inches. And we're not going to worry about 28 and 22 inches because uh, they reduced yield considerably, and, and we're, we want to we play in this 34 inches where we 
didn't reduce yield, but if we look at the whole rot strikes in this particular trial, here's, here's our gray, here's our 39 inches. We got, um, you know, almost 20 strikes per tree. Here's our, our purple is our 85, per, uh, is our sustained 85% reduction to the year, and we got almost the same amount of whole rot. But if we implemented this deficit irrigation at those first two weeks in July, which correspond to what? First two weeks of July? Hull split. Yes, yes, you're not asleep. And, uh, and so um, if we implemented that deficit irrigation at that point, we dramatically reduced hull rot. So that is the main goal of my presentation is not reducing, if you, you know, I have growers, they say, oh, I've got hull rot, I've got to irrigate less. No, it's not that you need to irrigate less throughout the whole season, it's, need, it's that you need to irrigate less at the first two weeks of hull split, usually the first two weeks of July, 4th of July. And this is looking at dead wood, we got the same amount, of, the dead wood amount corresponded to the hull rot strikes. So, um, based on Goldhammer's work, it's this, it's reducing your irrigation the first two weeks of July that had the biggest impact on hull rot. And that is um, the main point of my presentation. Sebastian warned me that I would get reduced in grant funding if I went over 15 minutes, so I'm being very careful. I think most of the entomologists have left the room, so I think, oh, I, no, I see Kent in the back. I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to point out an obvious fact here, and, uh, and Kent's going to come back. But, I'm, you know, why don't people, why don't growers implement that stress the first two weeks of July? Oh, it's the hottest two weeks of July. It's 105 out. My trees are going to get mites, and they're going to defoliate, and blah, 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 blah. And, and then you come back and you get hull rot, and you come back the next year and, and your lower canopy looks like that. Well, what happens to your mites the next year? If you, so say you got mites and you defoliated. You come back the next year, you put on a miticide, you got leaves, your, your mite, they might, Kemp's gonna say, oh, you had a yield reduction, you might, but you know, this, the, with hull rot and those strikes, your wood is dead forever, your lower canopy. And it's really hard for that to come back. So I, I am putting my plug in here that, that to say that hull rot damage is worse than mite damage. It can reduce your yield in the lower canopy for the rest of that orchard, moving, moving, your, moving your spur growth up, up high. And, and also, you know, I want to point out that, that almonds are, you know, they weren't, they didn't evolve where they were irrigated in the summertime and, and, you know, I've seen a lot more damage done to almonds being over-irrigated than under-irrigated. So <clears throat> I, I want to encourage you to practice that regulated deficit, and uh, you're not going to kill your trees. And, and actually, to do that, the best way to do that is to use a, a pressure chamber, a leaf stem water potential. And Cameron here is an expert on that. And in a, in a trial that, that I did in Madera County, um, you know, our fully irrigated trees, we tried to keep at minus seven to minus nine bars. You know, sometimes that gets a po impossible to keep later in the year. But the mild stress that we were trying to is achieve at early hull split is minus 14 to minus 18 bars. You know, right after you irrigate it, it could go up to minus 14 and right before you irrigate it, it's hopefully down at minus 18. You know, inevitably what happens with us is it is it we get to minus 20 and then we go to minus 10 or something. It's really hard to, to actually keep the trees in that minus 14 to minus 18 bars, but um, that that's what I would try to do. And after those two weeks of, of hull split, I never really get my orchards back to minus seven or nine bars. Maybe if you have perfect soil, but um, you might end up taking that stress towards harvest, but um, the point is, is, is you'd want to do this 
regulated deficit a very small period of time. And this is the data from the orchard where we were working where we where at the minus 14 to 18 bars, we only had about two strikes per tree on average, and in the control, we had uh, almost 18. I want to just say, you know, it's, it is common to put fungicide applications in hull split sprays. It is a free ride for a lot of people. Um, you know, I, I'd like to say that I'd like to see you try to control hull rot with, with irrigation management and nitrogen management because we have a lumber of, of pathogens. We have, you know, rust and we have anthracnose and we have alternary and bad areas that we're developing resistance to. So I would prefer that we didn't put fungicides out in July in a whole split spray. And I did some work with Botran, which is a good material for rhizopus a number of years ago. And you, and you see the, my hull split sprays at 1% at hull split at, uh, at, at um, greater than 1% hull sprit and 40% hull sprit did reduce hull rot when I was rating strikes per tree at um, August 26. But when I went back and looked at the dead wood in the springtime, I really had no difference between the, the spray treatments and the control. So in my opinion, the fungicide sprays are, are only slowing hull rot down at, at, at hull split rating for harvest. They're not, they're not stopping hull rot. It's still there. I still had the dead wood uh, when I came back and rated it in the spring. And I'm probably on the verge of running out of time now, huh? We're going to move now to Cameron. Uh, Cameron um, has some prep questions that he's going to ask to his colleagues there uh, and also open it for questions from you guys. So, Cameron. Sure, is this mic on? Awesome. So for any of you who don't know me, my name is Cameron Zuber. I'm a new farm advisor based in Merced County, covering almonds and other crops. There's some business cards in the back if you want to reach out to me. So firstly, thank you for all the presentations. Uh, since you're further down south in San Joaquin and you're up in the northern San Joaquin, I was wondering, depending on the region where someone grows, like Sac versus San Joaquin, North San Joaquin versus South, are there different considerations towards managing hull rot or thinking about hull rot that you have seen? All right, then I'm, I'm, I'm going to start here. So I don't think that there should be any difference in uh, whether in the anywhere from San Joaquin all the way to Kern County. As I mentioned earlier, you know, rhizopus and uh, recent in the in the recent years, Aspergillus loss has been very prevalent. The the only difference regionally we see that in the as I mentioned earlier in my talk, that in the Sacramento Valley, we see hull rot caused by monalinia is more prevalent, and management of monalinia is totally different from uh, rhizopus and Aspergillus. In a way, for example, you know, uh, monalinia is is a, is a fungus that you know probably uh, chemical management or fungicides can work with it. And applications of, of, of the fungicide for monalinia will be three weeks according to the recommendation of Dr. Adscavage before hull split. So that will put us anywhere uh, the, in the first week of, of June rather than the management we start for aspergillus and rhizopus that we start during hull split. So your main comment is not necessarily the region, but the type of hull rot, and the type might be more or less prevalent depending on the area. And I was going to point out <clears throat> for my presentation, I was primarily referring to rhizopus, which I, I think is probably the, the primary uh, hull rot causing uh, uh, fungus that we see most of the time. Uh, though. I have had, uh, I've sent samples to Mohammed. I have had Aspergillus uh, show up in a couple orchards, especially Super L, um, and, and that's why we planted Super L in our trial at, at Kearney, because uh, we were going to have a hull rot trial in the pollinators. But um, I did, I did want to point out, and Mohammed, have, have you seen a difference? Uh, I've noticed that sometimes when, when we're really uh, stressing the trees for rhizopus and that sometimes I've seen aspergillus 
under those greater stress conditions. Is that, is that true, or do you have a comment on that? So weather is, is, is more stress. It could be the more stress, but, but we know that you know, Aspergillus prefers warmer temperatures to grow compared to, to, to rhizopus. So in and, and the past few years, you know, we had quite, uh, quite a bit of hot summers that you know, are conducive for Aspergillus uh, growth and you know, causing disease. Um, and then, Mohammed, in your presentation, you mentioned that how badly these kind of strikes can affect your yield kind of informs a little bit. It's situational, right? But how can a grower determine how bad they have it and therefore determine if they need to be as worried about it? You know, this is a very difficult question. So really we can't tell, as, as, as I showed earlier, you know, uh, that's why I always say we need to know our, the history of our orchards, all right? And uh, it's sometimes worth to know if, 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 if you have mild uh, case of hot rot, probably you can get away with just doing cultural practices such as um, imposing mild stress using uh, deficit irrigation or monitoring your nitrogen. And that's all you need to, to get by. But if you, have, if you know that you have high incidence okay, of hot rot and you know that it's affecting your yield, all right, you can, you can sometimes tell if you have bad hot rot years and you can pick few trees and do counts and see the effect of that next year. But we always have to remember that, you know, there are so many factors goes into any yield. So, so I will be very cautious here to... So I guess a follow up there. Uh, to me, it was quite impressive also those graphics where you showed that you really need to have a lot of infected strikes, or infected trees to, to have a, a negative effect in yield. So um, it was uh, more than 50, I think it was the number, or more than... So if it was me, mm -hmm. I would say between, definitely above 60. 60. Above 60, 65. 60 strikes yes. per tree. So if, if, if you saw Don't panic the one, if you see less than that. Sorry? <laughs> Don't panic if you see less than that. No. I, I, I would not, based on, on the data I collected. Wow. So, so, so remember always, I like to go back to the basics. So it's, what is the damage Harrod is doing? It's killing spurs. That is going to bear next year's flowers, right? Usually the tree puts way much more flowers than it can handle, and we get more fruit set, that's one, all right? The, the second thing also to remember is each, each year the tree is growing and putting in new spurs. So to have a dramatic reduction in yield, we have to kill way much more spurs than the tree is regenerating, correct? And that's, that's, that's the common sense I see there. So, so sometimes that's why I'm saying, you know, bef before you put that spray on, you know, there's very good chemicals that work on hot rot. My experience personally with, with doing fungicide, I, I did not get any control over 50 to 55%. So you're still having 45% uh, that you are not controlling of our rot. And if you, if you have a better control with cultural practices or combine both, I would go with both, that's one. The second thing, remember that, you know, why I like to study the biology of the disease? Because it's all about the health split. You know, one of the things that is important for imposing mild distress or uh, what we call uh, deficit irrigation is to have synchronized hull split, one of the benefits. So if you are planning to do sprays, then actually doing that to synchronize hull split will help a lot. Why? Because remember, fungicides, we add them only to protect, not to cure. So if you have good coverage, good spray coverage, 
synchro with synchronized hull split to protect, then I expect to have a better uh, control than, you know, because if you, ha if you have 50% split and you put on a spray and later on the other 50 opened later on, then the other 50% are not, are not protected. So, so that's my logic with, 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 uh, with management. Um, connected to management, because you mentioned like looking at trees for spur death, are there any guidelines either you or Brent can give on if they don't have haul rot, when should they start looking for it, and a type of guideline for actually monitoring for this disease and pathogen? Well, um, um, you know, I, I just after after hull split, when you when you you know if you know usually. Um, you know you have it if, if you're starting to see strikes before harvest. Uh, um, and and that, that, that was one point that I, I forgot to mention. I was, I, was, I was giving the entomologists a hard time when I was comparing mite damage versus hull rot, but I, I wanted to plug there's association with uh, um, hull rot and navel orange worm. And, and a lot of times when those strikes are, are heavy enough that, that acid, the, the, you know, uh, sometimes we can shake those nuts off and, and they can go to harvest. The, the hull rot doesn't, doesn't damage the nut at all that season. But sometimes when hull rot is severe enough, um, those strikes will stick on the tree and, and if they dry up too soon. And, and there are, you know, especially if we're seeing some of those severe hull rot orchards could have four, 500 strikes per tree. Um, then you've got uh, them sticking on the tree and you've got a source of, of mummies for navel orange worm. So um, um, I did, I, I just, that was one relationship that I wanted to mention too of, of why to avoid uh, severe hull rot is you can, you can really build up your mummy and navel orange worm population if, if you're not uh, watching that. I have more questions, but if there's questions from the room, just signal me or just stand up. Go ahead. So we do this deficit irrigation, which 90% or 80% of the growers do not use pressure pumps. So what would you recommend they do? I have another question to go with that. Um, to repeat the question he asked, since monitoring for plant stress is helpful with deficit irrigation, but most growers don't have those tools, what can they use? Good question, Gary. Um, <clears throat> um, if, if they're on a drip or a microsprinkler system and they can control their irrigation, as a rule of thumb, I would try a 50% reduction in the amount of water they're putting on like, like Goldhammer did. For two weeks. For two weeks, yeah. So if you're, if you're irrigating, you, usually if you're, if you're running your system for 24 hours a week, I would, I would start by saying try 12. But um, there were a number of situations, you know, if, if, the, if the ground is heavy, and, you know, I remember Beth Tividale's slides that I removed from this, this talk so I wouldn't grow too long, but, you know, in, in one system in Kern County, one orchard in Kern County, it took them 49 days to get down to minus 14 bars when they pulled the water off. So you, that's why you, you have to sort of know your block and and know your, you know, average stress levels, but um, you know, and, and it really gets harder. Back back when we when we first had growers flooding, you know, how do you time a flood irrigation on a on a district cycle, and which is almost impossible. But but um, um, that's that's very hard to do, and and that's one of the reasons why the the pressure chamber allows us to monitor so much better. And, and I had situations where people weren't monitoring well. You could have, you know, a year like this, our, our soil pro profiles are so much more full with water now that we could, we probably, the pressure chamber is a good tool that we could probably start irrigation, irrigating a month later than we usually do. And, and we've seen, you know, the wet springs actually be, uh, turn out to be greater hull rot years than, than dry springs, for instance. So the question was uh, the effect on cutting back on pollinators with irrigation. 
Well, that's a, another very good point, Gary, that we didn't have time to get into, but I, I, know, I know some growers that have more advanced systems now, you know, say you got, you know, what, one of the reasons why I don't think we ever saw a haul rod on Fritz is because we were stressing the, the bejeebers out of them when we were harvesting our non -parels. And And so, uh, anyway, I, I do know growers now, in, most of the new orchards, they'll they'll design them so that they can turn the water, leave the water on the fritz while they're taking water off the non prel and then, you know, it's nice also at harvest time when, after you got the non prel crop, you know, um, off, you know, you can turn the you can turn the system on, and that's one of the nice things about some some growers I've seen turn drip on even even when the the almonds are still windrowed. Right. Yeah if they have that complexity. So the question was, since some of this is from the soil, should we be thoughtful of when we're mowing? Definitely. You know, just last year I, I had a call with, uh, with, a, with a grower that had a bad case of hard rot. So the grower mows exactly during hull split. He had his own reasons to do so. So luckily I met him again two weeks ago, and he's gonna change that to do it earlier, right? So mowing or creating dust or even irrigators driving really fast between rows, okay? So all is gonna happen is what I show earlier. You know, they're gonna create dust. This dust gonna carry spores with them. This dust is going to land on the fruit. So if, if you have hull split already started, so some of those spores are going to go inside. So at that point, there is nothing much can be done. So definitely reducing dust and dust management should be an important part of hull rot management. Do all soils have aspergillus and rhizopus? Probably. Does amount matter? <laughs> so, you know, no, no, nobody looked at it, but 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 the whole idea, if 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 you probably have very high populations of aspergillus or rhizopus in any soil, just creating the dust or you have a little wind, so the whole idea is that those spores needs to find their way in, uh, to the fruit, and the only way it's it's going to come to the fruit, it's either they, you know come on dust, or if there is very early fruit that has quite a bit of uh, rhizopus and sporulating on the outside, but those fruits like, uh, for example, the early ones that split, the empty ones that split at the top, usually they get bad rhizopus, but those as a source of inoculum is, is very limited. It's, it's mainly the soil. You know, uh they often call rhizopus bread mold, and, and you know, I, I, one of the pictures I have is a piece of bread <laughs> covered with a green-black mold, and, and that was left in a house, you know. And uh, so it's amazing to me, rhizopus is just ubiquitous, and, you know, it can be everywhere, and it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to mold your bread in the house if you leave it out on, on your counter, you know. So uh, all, those, all those, those hulls are nice loaves of bread when they split open <laughs> for rhizopus. I um, was taking notes here and I just want to say uh, there's a lot of very good key message shared by all of you. Uh, after years of research, I just uh, grow, grow four of them here. Starting by first knowing your causal agent. I think that's really key, really important. So thank you, Mohammed, for sharing that. Also, um, everybody here focusing on cultural practices, irrigation and nitrogen as the main tool to, to control this disease. And the do not panic comment, I think, is also very relevant. Do not panic a little bit of whole rot. It's not going to be the end of the world. There is a, a clear opportunity for money saving or by avoiding or reducing fungicides, especially in, in, in multiple locations. So all of this, I think, justified by years of research, years of work. Um, so thank you very much to all of you.